Hello, so, welcome to the second oh, floor. Yeah. Hopefully you can hear us a little better. But there are, I know there's also video on this floor. Okay, good. So, um, so the second and third floor of the show um, look at the work of contemporary artists who um, were inspired and influenced by Riot Girl. Um, and so and kind involved of, with and involved with Riot Girl. Um, and kind of the basis for the show is, you know, both Ashley and I in the 90s were involved with uh, Riot Girl chapters in LA and in the Bay Area. And that has had a huge influence on our lives. But we also have realized that it's also had a huge influence on a lot of the people in our world, you know, and a lot of the people we know who are involved with Riot Girl have gone on to become activists, to become professors, to become um, artists. And so, um, you know, the inspiration for the show is really sort of looking at and reflecting on, the, on this movement's influence on a, on a generation of people. Um, so, uh, in terms of the kind of um, thinking about how we constructed the show, we invited seven artists, um, and we didn't want to just show one particular work from them. We kind of wanted to show the, the breadth of um, their practice and how it's developed from, you know, the, their early in, involvement with Riot Girl to a certain extent, and then um, to where they've landed today to kind of show the arc of that. So, some people are represented by work over 15 or 20 years, um, including work from, like, fresh out of college or very, or actually some high school work. Um, yeah. Some of their zines are on the first floor and then you go, come upstairs and you see the, the work that they've made since then. Yeah. Um, so I guess we should maybe start talking about um, Allison Mitchell's yeah. area oh, right here. Career. Hey, Allison. Come Allison. Here. <laughs> so um, Al this is Allison Mitchell Hi. and she drove all the way down from Toronto to be here. So... Um, we're getting you all mic'd up so you can okay. chat. Um, but anyway, so Allison Mitchell, uh, a lot of her work um, takes, uh, you know, it's real good. Uh, takes sort of deals with pop culture and um, kind of viewing that through a queer and feminist lens. But you, in your early years, um, you're involved with the Fat Action Performance Group, um, pissed off and um, pretty porky and pretty pissed off. off and pretty pr pretty porky. Pretty porky and pissed off. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we have a lot of different work, and you also um, run a really amazing space in Toronto called the Feminist Art Gallery with Deirdre Logue, who is here. Where's Deirdre? Hi. Uh, <laughs> they just drove down from Toronto last night. Yeah. So they're. It's not that far. It's only five and a half hours to drive here. And I'm going to work it backwards a little bit. Okay. Uh, right now, I'm currently working on a giant project, which is called Killjoy's Castle. It's a lesbian feminist haunted house uh, that will be happening in Toronto on October 16th, and which is, which is basically a culmination of all of my work. It has performance, uh, installation, sculpture, video projection. It's an all-encompassing experience. Um, and then most recently... Deirdre Logue, my lover, and I uh, opened a feminist art gallery called FAG three years ago. And we created a video um, kind of montage of documentation of our first three years as an open gallery. It includes lots of pictures of uh, activist events, um, gatherings, art documentation, um, readings, gluten-free muffin top, artist talks, and sinks full of dirty dishes because it requires a lot of hospitality and labor to run an art gallery, as yeah. lots of people know. <laughs> um, and then more recently from a body of work that I made called Creep Les, there's two framed found shirts with interventions on them. One says, it used to say teachers have class, and I changed that to say women's studies professors have class privilege, because I am one of those things. <laughs> and I struggle with the implications of having this position in the academy and a full-time paying job and the, you know, the implications of that around class hierarchies and things like that. So, and the other one is a, a beautiful rainbow moo moo that says I'm with problematic instead of I'm with stupid. Um, <laughs> And the wallpaper behind that is um, an earlier p piece of work that came from a, um, an installation I did called um, A Girl's Journey to the Well of Forbidden Knowledge. And part of that exhibition um, included these wallpaper, uh, wallpapers, wallpaper created from drawings from the bookshelves of the Lesbian History Archives in Brooklyn, New York. Hey, Allison? Yes. Oh, sure. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> 
And then the more the older work that I have in the exhibition are these three um, giantess monsters from the um, installation titled Lady Sasquatch. And um, all of this work encompasses ideas that I'm not only not interested in, but actually really love. The idea of um, interrupting spaces in relation to privilege um, through representing bodies that we don't necessarily see, histories that we don't normally see, knowledges that are so important that are such a part of activists' uh, training and, um, and uh, inspiration. So the, it, this work really works well together to have this video of something that's currently happening with these older pieces that also rest on the foundation of um, the feminist and queer theory on the bookshelves that you see behind. I didn't go to art school, I'm not trained as an artist, but I am trained as a feminist theorist. So the, sculptures, the sculptural work that you see here and the video work rests on the foundation of feminist and queer critical theory um, more so than uh, Jansen's version of art history. So I think that's probably okay. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds great. And you guys you. are seeing this video for the first time. They made it just for the show. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thanks. So this whole room is work by Tammy Ray Carland, um, who's here from Oakland. And um, Tammy Ray was uh, heavily involved uh, with uh, Riot Girl in Olympia in the in the late '80s and early '90s. Uh, you uh, started a label called Mr. Lady that was such a, hu a huge influence on a lot of people. You wrote the zine I Heart Amy Carter. You also oh, ran. I should just mention. Yeah. So. Um, Tammy Ray was one of the curators for the tables downstairs. So she oh, yeah. did an American South and Mr. Lady Records uh, playlist. Yeah, and you were also based in North Carolina for a while too. Yeah. So I should mention that, yeah. that as well, not just focus on the Olympia side. But, um, and you also ran a nonprofit art gallery too. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, and in, your, in your early work, you were looking at performance in the mm -hmm. 80s. But um, a lot of the photographs you see here are more like looking at your own autobiography through queer and feminist lens. Mm -hmm. um, what? Louder. Louder? Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's sort of the, a general overview. Do you want to like talk about the individual works that you see here? Or? Yeah, I mean, I would say a little bit too about that nonprofit gallery in Olympia, which yeah. was called Reclamuse, which I feel like was the kind of a real jumping off point for me as an artist and a jumping off point for Riot Girl. Um, two or three of the other women. It started by nine women. We were photography students at the Evergreen State College in 1988, and we started this place called Reclamuse. And um, one of two of them were my best friends in college, Kathleen Hanna and Heidi Arbogast. Were th so we were three of the nine women, and that began a lot of the or sort of really kind of basic conversations that kind of birthed Riot Girl came out of that space. So it's, really it's a really special. interesting space, um, and. A little louder. Oh, okay. I can talk. I can talk loud. Yeah, that might. Okay. I'm not scary. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just want to mention that, and then I think the thing about performance is really interesting. So when I was in college and sort of Olympia in the '80s and sort of the beginning conversations of Riot Girl, I was doing a lot more performance stuff and. I would dress like a little girl. I mean, this is where a lot of that aesthetic came from with little barrettes in my hair. I was sort of the mad little girl making work about class and trauma and being a girl. Um, and uh, making a lot of photographs and a lot of videos based on those narratives. And over the years, what's interesting is your, the sort of disappearance of the person, I think is really interesting in the work now. Um, occasionally people still uh, appear in my work, but a lot of times it's the residual or the after effect or what is dismissed from a performance that's really interesting to me now. So you have, on here is a body of work that I started in the 90s and finished in the early 2000s called Lesbian Beds. And so they're all photographs of beds of lesbians, um, couples and single women who were all in my friendship group in primarily in North Carolina. Um, and they're you know, they're photographed from a bed, from above in an aerial kind of way as a kind of flatting out and a kind of looking at them in like a super flat painting kind of style way. 
Um, and over there you have a project called um, um, An Archive of Feelings, which is named after a book by Anne Spekovich, who is a writer and a theorist who's a friend of mine and somebody I've been in dialogue with a lot. And I named the body of work after her book that had to, was looking at um, lesbian um, ordinary vernacular performance and activism and affect and feelings. Um, and I made that work, um, that was the first project I did after becoming a parent and having a child and from a really insulated place of being home and by myself with a baby and just kind of constantly looking around my home and being triggered by sort of memories and thinking about objects and kind of the affect. And I was really thinking about memorials and um, I just was at a time in my life where I was really looking at loss and people I had lost to AIDS and, and what have you. And so really looking at objects and their capacity to uh, create affect. It's a real snapshot. <laughs> and then the more latter work is from this series of photographs called I'm Dying Up Here, which I started looking specifically at comedy and women comedians and a sort of history of female comedians and um, feminist comedians, which I think almost every woman who does comedy is a feminist, whether they want to be one or not. Just the act of doing that, of acting out. A lot of really assertive, aggressive material. It's a space where people can talk about sexism and homophobia and racism that isn't allowed in other cultural forms. Um, and I'm really sort of interested in the women who did it, and I was photographing performance artists and comedians, but they started disappearing from the work. I mean, not disappearing, I had control over that. And I really started focusing on these stages and the after effect of a performance. Um, yeah, so that's the sort of snapshot. I feel like I went really fast. Excellent job. Um, any So Miranda July lives in LA now. Um, she was unable to make it. She's got a very tiny child. Um, and uh, let's see, Miranda. Miranda started making work when, um, when well, I guess her, her first public work was when she was in high school, she put on a play that was at um, 924 Gilman, which is a punk club in, in Berkeley, or was, doesn't it's still exist there. anymore. It's, it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. I went Sorry. there a few months ago, actually. <laughs> um, and that was a play that was based on her correspondence with a, um, a pen pal who was in prison. And since then, she's been involved with a lot of, um, uh, she's, or she, she was involved with a lot of bands. So we've got her, some of her early recordings here. Um, her zine from when she was in high school is downstairs. And we also have some really rare recordings from the 2002 Whitney Biennial and some other places. Um, and she's gone on to do performances, uh, feature length films, um, novels. Novels. She does a lot of writing, uh, art. She does a million things, <laughs> like a lot of the artists here. Um, one project we wanted to point out was is in this table in the middle, which is uh, Joni for Jackie, who was originally called Big Miss Moviola. And that was a project that she put together to um, to see other to see movies by other females. She had dropped out of film school in Santa Cruz and um, moved up to the Pacific Northwest. And um, this was all before YouTube. <laughs> and. Uh, she, you know, she would invite people to send in um, females to send in their movies, and then they would get their movie along with nine other um, movie makers on the same chain letter tape. And there was a booklet that would come with all the tapes, with letters written by each of the artists, um, each of the video makers, to the other people. So you could see some of the videos um, on the monitor on there. And I think it created a lot of community, just like the zine you know, zines downstairs. Um, and that's sort of what, you know, inspired her to create this too, is just to see other women's films, you know, and then get them out there. Um, and she also followed that up with a tour. So she started screening these and a tour. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the films that would shoot oh. actually in the performances? Yeah. Um, so she would all, for the journey, for the journey for Jackie tours, she would also make a, a movie on the spot with the people who showed up. So she would, um, uh, like usually the, the shows were her performing and as well as the selections from the chain letter tapes but then she would have a video camera set up in like the last bathroom stall or in a closet somewhere in this um, you know if it was in a house or whatever and people would um, 
she would invite people to complete the prompt. And the main prompt, I think, or for the ones that I've been to, were um, no, the, no, yeah, nobody, nobody ever, ever told, told me. me, and then anyone could finish that sentence. And then at the end of the night, you'd see the video with all the people that you've been sitting in the room with, like complete their sentence. And there's just some just amazing um, things that you would never imagine of the people that you're you know, just a few inches away from. Yeah, and sort of created a feeling of intimacy in the circle. But it's also, again, this is before YouTube, too. So just sort of like being, being able to express yourself in that way on film was a really revolutionary act. Um, so, yeah, and so we also have some of her more recent works, like Learning to Love You More, also, again, gives a platform. Not too recent, but. <laughs> well, yeah, um, it, it, it also creates a platform for the audience. So basically, she worked with Harold Fletcher, and they um, built a website where they put out assignments for the audience. And people responded to those assignments. Um, and some of them, and they're very you know, quirky and fun, like take a picture from underneath your bed and people posting photos of pictures from underneath their bed. So they're really, you should spend some time looking through them. They're really great. Um, and then we also have two videos here. Um, uh, and this is a documentation of um, some of her performances. A lot of these have actually, haven't been screened before. Yeah. Um, and then we also have a, um, Real of some of her other films too, particularly older films from the late 90s. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's basically this section.